So my name is Carlos Calmar. I'm the music director of the Oregon Symphony. And uh, this is Gabriel Cahane, the composer of the, this amazing piece of music. And as always, uh, these pre-concert conversations are just conversations. And of course, we have not talked about what we want to say. We have not. Yeah. <laughs> this is, is truly unpremeditated. I wanted just to give you a little bit of background in terms of general things um, as well as particular things about this piece. We, the Oregon Symphony, last season, at the start of the season, embarked on something that I think is very new uh, in terms of programming in the United States as far as classical music orchestra is concerned. We, um, we thought about tackling three social themes with this mini-series called Sounds of Home. And uh, the first one was immigration, the second was the environment, and uh, the third one is about lack of home, being homeless. And that's the piece that we are going to, matter of fact, play for you and record tonight here. Now, when you embark something like that as an orchestra and you do it like we did it, there are a couple of things that you actually have no idea what they will be. Because um, when we did the immigration piece, we actually contacted a writer and a composer, and they worked together to create something. And what they created in the end was something that was very moving, um, talking about immigration. I would even say talking a little bit about being um, away from home, as a matter of fact. And it took a little bit of a look, what I would say, from 30,000 feet above, which was wonderful. And we, of course, uh, here um, in Portland, we enjoyed the result very much. When we did the piece about environment, there we knew a little bit better what to expect because we worked with a visual artist. And what we did is we played uh, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, and we told the visual artist, do something with that <laughs> piece, and uh, always thinking about the environment. And he did an enormous work in terms of photography of different settings here in Oregon, and utilized and altered, etc., etc., etc. Now, I'm telling all of this because our approach as an institution, and even my approach as uh, the conductor of all uh, three projects was always, yes, you work with a composer, a writer, and you give them as little as possible in terms of it has to be exactly this. The only thing that was kind of understood was things, the technical things like length of piece, and even that is a variable. And the other thing that we told, um, our artists that created something for us was um, stay away from day-to-day -day politics because we are thinking that all three themes and the theme that we are talking about tonight is the same, unfortunately have been with us as human beings for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years and we are not going to solve the problem tonight but we might contribute a little bit to the discussion. So that was the thing. And then we came to this gentleman, and uh, I think you can already take it from here because I think it, all of you should know what your first reaction was when we told yeah, yeah. you yeah. what to write something like this. So I got a call in, I think it was May of, 2016, uh, I think it was 2016, maybe 2017, who knows, <laughs> um, from Charles Calmer, who is not Carlos Calmar. <laughs> it's very confusing. There, there's a pre precondition of working at this institution that all high artistic staff share cognates in their name, or they're not, they're not given a job. And he said, would you like to write a, a 45 minute piece on homelessness, and in my head I said, of course not. Um, for one thing, there is this kind of cognitive dissonance of 
a beautiful, ornate concert hall that, generally speaking, caters to a fairly privileged audience um, that sits at the doorstep of a community who are living in abject poverty. And my first question is, well, who is this really for? Is this, will this really serve the community, or is this so that an institution can pat itself on the back and say, we've done, you know, we've done our part uh, in, in name? Um, on the other hand, I think that it is incredibly important that we wade into these problems. We have, we have the, the choice to, to remain silent, to, to stay away from politics in music and therefore reinforce the status quo, or we can dive headlong into the messiness of um, the question of who, who is speaking on whose behalf and in what space are, are these ideas being explored. Um, and then finally, there's, there's just the fact that as a young composer, when you're invited to write a piece for one of the great orchestras in America, you don't say no. <laughs> um, so, but I, I, I accepted the commission and I began to think, how, how does one tackle an issue like this? And one of the, un the other central conundra for me is that I'm a big believer in the idea that all great art has a certain amount of ambiguity, moral ambiguity, emotional ambiguity, narrative ambiguity, spiritual ambiguity, intellectual ambiguity. And the current crisis of homelessness here in Portland, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, in so many cities across the country and, and elsewhere outside of the country, which I view as one expression of the resurgence of deep poverty. This phenomenon is not something that has a tremendous amount of ambiguity in terms of how, how we got here. Um, there are, you know, we can sort of look at, at certain policy decisions over the last 40 years or so and say, well, this kind of makes sense. This is why, why we've arrived here. It's not so simple, but, but there's a general trajectory that leads us to this moment. And the last thing that I wanted to do was to make a piece that felt like a polemic. Some people may experience it as a polemic, but that's not, that's not my intention. Um, and so the, the question becomes, how do you make something artful that has a kind of emotional and intellectual spectrum that's not simply you know, shaking the fist at capitalism, although there's a little bit of that. Um, and, and it was, I think, first in reading Matthew Desmond's great book, Evicted, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 2016, and then through my uh, more hands-on volunteering, or rather hands-on research in the form of volunteering at a shelter in Manhattan, uh, that I came to really understand how, how I wanted to tackle the piece. And it was really, again, as I said earlier, about um, exploring housing insecurity as just one facet of poverty, and to try to shrink the divide between those of us who live with enough and those who live with not enough. and and to sort of propose in this time where I think we experience a massive empathy deficit in our politics, uh, in our digital lives, um, to propose that we are so much closer to the experience of not having than we might believe, that, that we are one job loss, one uh, medical emergency away from being forced to make very, very difficult decisions between paying the grocery bill, paying the gas bill, so on and so forth, and, and to try to create um, a tapestry of the various ways in which we experience not having enough so as to kind of create um, a, a more immediate sense of, of these issues. I think that by listening to uh, how Gabriel, what Gabriel felt before he even started to write the first note, you get a little bit of a sense um, of what is waiting for you. And that is why I actually talked a little bit uh, for a minute or two about the other two projects that we did and talked about the 30,000 feet. So what you're going to hear tonight has nothing to do with 30,000 feet. It's like, oh, let's go head on into the, the issue of homelessness and by doing so, discovering that uh, homelessness is just a consequence of a very different problem which is called poverty, deeply, deeply rooted poverty, and that in any country of the world, yes, this, this is an American composer, it's an American orchestra, 
I feel very Portland. Yes, I was born somewhere else. Uh, but, but this could be anywhere in the world because there is unfortunate poverty in the entire world. And I would say also kind of following up on what you said that the unfortunate thing is that we in the United States are a country that um, gives all of us the possibility of being well off. Let's just say it that. The possibilities here are amazing. However, the other way around, the possibility of being quite well off or even having enough to live and then falling immediately off the cliff also is something that happens in this country, I would say in a way harsher way than anywhere else. And I can speak to that. I lived 38 years of my life in Europe where uh, simply what Gabriel just said simply doesn't happen that way. The idea that you actually all of a sudden fall sick and you have to ask yourself, are you going to get treatment or are you going, stuff like yeah, that. I, I would love to just inter interject a, a few things there. Uh, one of the things that I found as a, as a as somewhat of a newbie to this subject matter when I began volunteering was the discovery that so many people in New York City who are experiencing homelessness are working, and many of them are working full time. And there's a, uh, you know, the unsheltered population that we see in Portland, in San Francisco, in, in Los Angeles represents a very specific subset of those who are experiencing homelessness. And it's very easy for us to uh, sort of extrapolate that the texture of all homelessness has to do with substance abuse and mental illness. And obviously that, that's a huge part of, of the experience of homelessness for some people. But the vast majority of people who are experiencing homelessness as defined by HUD at the federal level, we don't see because they're living in motels, they're living in shelters, they're living with family, they're living in encampments. And for that population, the experience is, is quite different. And, and this sort of brings me back to an earlier uh, quandary that I had, which is this question of who is this for? Is this for us to sort of pat ourselves on the back and say, and I realize I'm, I'm being a little provocative here, but I think these are the, we have to, we have to wrestle with this. Who, who is this for? And when I finally, you know, got, got inside the research and started working on the libretto, it became clear to me that the only way that I could feel sort of ethically right about this piece is to have on stage people who have experienced some of the things that, that we're talking about. And so in the last movement, for those of you who are hearing this piece for the first time and didn't hear it in May, you'll meet the Maybell community singers who are an extraordinary bunch of people from the Maybell Center just down the street uh, you know, a few blocks away, uh, whose, whose primary mission is to create community for those living in poverty. And one of the ways in which they do that is through this incredible community chorus. And I, I think I speak for Carlos when I say that, that um, meeting our friends from, from the Maybell Singers and working with them and their being generous to share their experiences and to sing these words which I know for, for some of them were, ex were difficult to, to sing, um, and sort of getting through the kind of ethical murkiness of me, a very privileged, straight white guy, writing about these experiences and, and having, having these, uh, I think, really deeply courageous people, almost all of whom have never sung in a situation like this, to get up on stage with a, with a symphony orchestra was really deeply moving and uh, kind of just world expanding for me. I, I would say that the world expanding is also, um, I can only speak for myself, is um, meeting the people of this chorus, of the Mabel uh, Center chorus, is pretty much life-changing. Because just to be, no, I don't want to be provocative, but I walk through Portland and of course I see, I see the tents, I see people lying on the streets, and of course I am in that sense guilty of anger because the minute when I found on my doorstep where I live 
um, just a needle that somebody had thrown away, I get very, very angry because I have two little children. Let us say myself. But no, I don't want to have that. So, in a way, my attitude probably was, I don't want to see that, I don't want to deal with it. Goodbye. And then I uh, went for the first time to the, uh, to the chorus to rehearse with them, and the first thing that I noticed is the, the, the wash over of love, that these people, if I can say, speak about them in this way, uh, some of them are probably in the room. Yeah, they are just amazing and they are grateful. And then I get very grateful for being allowed to work with them. I don't want to, in that sense. So I, I learned a lot uh, with just meeting these people. And just for your information, if after or during, or if you have questions about the Mabel Center, if you don't know it, uh, I can point to John Alsh. John, where for us? The executive director, John Alsh, of the Mabel Center. If you, all I'm saying is, if you don't know the center, talk to him. He knows everything about it. I, I think the salient point, though, to put it bluntly, is that we we lead we lead sheltered lives, and and one of the great uh, privileges for me of this piece is you know getting you know getting outside of this bubble, and and I think that we we tend in this country to live in communities that tend not to be socioeconomically diverse, um, and I think that's a problem for so many reasons and and it's been a, a great pleasure to uh and uh, you know and uh, as i said you know kind of world expanding for me experience um to to get to know these these people and sing with them not just in may but again for this recording i wonder do we have more to say or should, should we solicit questions is that crazy if you have questions just shout should we them take out. a few questions i can i can only if you t if i take one minute more of oh, of course uh, because I want to talk about how this piece works, or how it, I don't know whether I can say how it's written. You are way better. <laughs> so this is a piece in 13 songs, movements. Uh, it utilizes a big orchestra, quite an array of percussion instruments, four soloists. One of them is a single mezzo-soprano slash singer chanteuse chanteuse and then three absolutely amazing artists uh, uh, Holland Andrews who is a local vocal artist with vocal techniques that you cannot imagine uh, Holcomb Waller <laughs> sitting here <laughs> yeah. Hol Holcomb Another. Waller who is a fantastic songwriter and singer that I am privileged now to know. And also a Portland and local. And also this gentleman. So they are kind of, the role of them is, if I can say this, is the Greek chorus that comments. We're called the chorus of the inconvenient statistics. And this was, I, you know, I said earlier that, that I was sort of wrestling with this question of what does it mean to tackle these issues in this kind of space. And I felt that if I dealt just with the, you know, the level of human psychology, intimate stories, interviewing people, which I did quite a bit of, and putting those stories on stage and having us feel things, that we ran the risk of, you know, having our hearts opened and, you know, and then leaving. And it's like, oh, we had a nice time. And the chorus of inconvenient statistics for me is there to pour cold water on neoliberalism, in a sense, <laughs> and to, to basically that that we're we're here to talk about in a kind of fun-loving, sometimes acerbic, sometimes sardonic way, the cold hard facts. Um, and I think that at the premiere in May, the, you know, there there were those um, who felt uncomfortable about about the presence of this this chorus, who who really, you know. Anything that's going to make you uncomfortable is going to come from the trio. It's probably not going to I come actually from actually don't. So I, I actually don't even believe in that. Yeah, if, if this piece... So, I don't want to tell you too much about this piece because you have to experience it, but the piece has a, an enormous amount of layers. The piece 
is very serious and very funny, um, but it's especially one of the movements which I consider is very, very funny, Holcomb's movement, I call it, um, is one of those things where you laugh and you choke at the same time. <laughs> and uh, I would say, if this piece at any time makes you a little uncomfortable, he, he might not say it, I say it, it's intentional. Yeah, uh, it, it's absolutely it's, intentional. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not meant to make you uncomfortable, like I, I don't want to hear it. It's, it's because the topic itself is just something that I believe we all have to deal with and looking away doesn't do the trick. Well, yeah, and I would say before we take a few questions from the audience, I would say that without giving away too much of the kind of structural makeup of the piece, most of the piece is in the form of a question. And that's by design for some reasons among them that I'm trying to just lob a bunch of questions out to you, the audience, to, to wrestle with over the course of the evening and, and I hope when you leave. But on, on that note, I would love just because we've done three of these in May and I think it would be great to, to uh, solicit questions. And they can be tough questions. Yes. The question was, who is this for? And, you know, uh, I think it is, I think in, in the way in which the piece asks difficult questions, it is for this audience to wrestle with their relationship to systemic poverty and to wrestle with questions, and, and not just systemic poverty, but also housing discrimination, uh, structural racism, systemic racism, and the ways in which uh, we, we may continue to benefit from, from those uh, structural issues even in 2018. Uh, I think that, you know, Carlos mentioned at the outset that, that I was told this can't be political. <laughs> And I immediately said, well, that's preposterous. You, cannot, you can't do a piece about homelessness and, and have it be apolitical. And so to, you know, to the question of who is this for, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm the son of a psychologist and a musician, and I'm always trying to operate from a place of expanding the capacity for empathy of people who are experiencing my work. And, and so, I'm trying to provoke not to shame anyone, and we specifically say that in the piece. We're not, we're not trying to shame anyone, but I do want people to be forced to take a really hard look at the nature of their privilege. Um, and, and also, for those who experience the piece who do not have a great deal of privilege, to hear their stories told and, and to have, you know, have those stories given voice. That being said, it's messy. It's messy. So that's, that's as close as I can get to an answer. Yes. Uh, so the question is, how did we find Gabriel? Well, actually that was, I wouldn't say easy, but it was for us, kind of, we need Gabriel Cahen. It was because we knew one piece or two that he wrote before. And um, I think it's not wrong to say you are very interested in songwriting as an art form, and you are very, very interesting in songwriting uh, where um, what you say is not only just, oh, it's pretty, y what you want to say is really matters. Uh, so, uh, I give you one example. Of course, I know some of his Craigslist songs. He wrote songs based on Craigslist. Uh, <laughs> but he also wrote a song... I was 25, I didn't know better. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember, and this might be an... I don't know how old the piece is, uh, listening once, and you know the title way better, I'm very bad with that, about the... the, the 50 Empire, yeah, yeah, Empire Liquor Mart. Yeah, this, yeah. which tells us... You can watch it on YouTube. On the what? The There's uh, the song is called Empire Liquor Mart, and it's from an album called The Ambassador, which is kind of a study of Los Angeles, and it tells the story of Latasha Harlins, who was an African American teenager who, in 1991, was killed uh, 
by a shop owner of a convenience store uh, in a dispute over a bottle of orange juice for which she had money to pay and was shot point blank in the head and her assailant was given community service and that was that was the extent um, so essentially that answers the question in the sense of yeah this this is your man <laughs> well I, I i was i was surprised to get the phone call and i was quite pleased i, mean, I wasn't pleased at first i was <laughs> go away mm -hmm. but then then it was good afterward i think there was a question over here somewhere yes Mm. And my question is, was this choir formed for this, or is it ongoing and they always have a choir? It's, it's ongoing, and John can speak a little more to that. This choir was formed about uh, two years ago, and as uh, Gabriel and Carlos said, it was formed uh, for the purpose of creating community in another way. And so it's been an ongoing uh, uh, choir. It's made up of our members, which are the people who Serve. It's made up of volunteers. Uh, it's also made up of staff members. So it's very, very welcoming. And it also, uh, for the purpose of what you see tonight, it also includes people from other organizations uh, who we've brought in as a part of the collaboration. Uh, and frankly, it can include any of you. <laughs> so uh, there are, uh, there are in, we're, we're about a community that may have also Thank you so much, John. I think we can take three more questions. Uh, I think, yes, yes. please. This is a this is an amazing idea. I will sadly be on tour, but maybe there's some folks coming. If I'm here, talk to me. <laughs> That's wonderful. There was a question Please. right here, and yeah, yeah. When you were here in May, um, this will be my third time seeing it tonight. I'm so thrilled. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So if I can, I don't know about Brit, I wasn't involved in that, and I think Brit happened before the piece was premiered, the Brit Festival commitment. Oh, no. no, they they heard it and they... Oh, 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 well, they were part of the commissioning group. They were yeah. part of yeah. the commission. Brit, yes. So whenever you premiere... So Sorry. the question was, uh, this piece was also after Portland, it was in the Brit Festival in the summer, and the question was how it went, and also whether there are follow-up performances. And of course, I can answer from my perspective. I have done a fair share of world premieres in my life, and of course, what you want is that this little baby gets to walk. And um, I cannot control whether it can walk, but I can tell you that the Brit Festival, you tell how it went, but I can tell you this piece will be and I'm violating, actually, my protocol. It will be in Jul at the beginning of July in Grand Park Music Festival in Chicago, and I will be there. And uh, I, I am not the... I cannot violate certain protocols, but I can say that there are half a dozen other orchestras where we're...